Good evening. Welcome to another installment of the Naperville Astronomical Association's monthly Astronomy Fundamentals program. I'm Drew Carhart, the current club president. Our fundamentals programs and our regular monthly meeting programs are currently all being streamed online. You can find the schedule on our website at naperastro.org and also get program announcements by following us on Facebook. With the nature of tonight's program, we're not setting up for questions and answers, but we still welcome general suggestions about programming via comments at naperastro.org or the Facebook comments column. This evening, our presentation is on star stories, the folklore tales that various cultures around the world transformed into the stories that they saw pictured in the sky. Before narrating some tales that we have chosen to share this evening, I would like to speak a bit about the whole concept of why people have written stories into the stars. You might commonly read or hear people say that various cultures have placed their myths and fables among the stars to glorify those stories. But there is a much more practical reason why nearly every culture we know of recognizes their own constellation patterns in the stars and has stories to go along with them. In the modern world, we don't think too much about the stars. They're hard to see from any of the places we live because of the current levels of light pollution. But if you lived a long time ago, knowing the stars, recognizing them, would have been important in your day-to-day -day life. When we want to know what the date is or the time is, or where we are or how to get somewhere, we have our cell phones. Our parents and grandparents had clocks and calendars, maps and compasses. But before those things were invented, people had the stars to serve all of those purposes. Knowing the stars could help you find your way home at night, tell you the time, or let you know when the season was about to change. The changing patterns of stars in the nighttime sky can serve as amazing tools in many ways. If you grew up 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 years ago, your parents would likely have taught you the night sky, so you would have access to all of the tools that it offers. You would have also seen thousands of stars in your nighttime sky in the time before our modern era when the night is filled with light pollution. When we look at any scattering of many points or points of light, our minds tend to see patterns in the random dots. We can make pictures from such patterns in the stars. We call such pictures asterisms or constellations. And it is much easier to teach someone a story made of patterns rather than just memorizing a random sprinkling of dots. The need that people had in the past to teach the stars to their next generations probably has a lot to do with why cultures all around the world and all through time have had their own versions of stories told by the night sky, probably more so than a simple desire to place fables, people, and gods among the stars. For this evening, we had many possible sources of star stories to choose from. Constellation tales all began as oral storytelling, and thus most exist in many versions and variations. We decided to use this wonderful book, Star Stories, Constellation Tales from Around the World, by Andy Wilkes and Anita Ganeri, to read from. The book includes many lovely illustrations by Mr. Wilkes, but what you will be seeing here is original art rate work created for tonight by my partner, Adrian Stroop. We're going to share four star stories from around the world. You might notice that the stories are sometimes sad. People felt that they could honor someone good who came to a sad end by placing them in the stars. Many of the constellations that astronomers use today are based on ones developed by the ancient Greeks over 2,000 years ago. So we'll start with a story from the Greek star myths.
Phaeton and the Swan Among the stars of the northern skies is a majestic swan, its long neck and wings outstretched. Long ago, the swan was a man who lived on earth. Today, it glides through the Milky Way for all eternity. At the far end of the earth, the golden palace of Helios, the sun god, was a magnificent place. With each new dawn, as the stars faded and the night sky grew pale, Helios burst forth through the fortress gates and drove his gleaming chariot through the sky, bringing light to the world once more. The chariot was pulled by four fiery horses and was so bright that few could bear its glow. Day after day, Helios's mortal son, Phaeton, had watched his father race across the heavens. Now he had a request to make. Please, father, he said, let me drive your chariot just for one day. Shaking his head, Helios turned blazing eyes on his son. I cannot grant your wish, he said. The path through the sky is too dangerous for you. At first, it rises so steeply that my horses can hardly climb. Then it so soars so high that even my heart trembles with fear. Finally, it charges down. One false move and you would dive headlong into the sea. Ask me for anything, but not this. But Phaeton had been waiting for this day for years, and besides, there was no time to lose. The gates of dawn were already peeking open, spreading its rosy glow across the world. So, reluctantly, Helios agreed. The horses were yoked to the chariot, and, taking the reins, Phaeton sped off, dizzy with delight. Suddenly, disaster struck. The horses were used to a heavier load, and unburdened, they ran wild. From high to low, low to high, the chariot veered, and where it touched earth, it set it ablaze. Mountains erupted with fire, rivers and lakes dried up, deserts were scorched, and whole forests burned to the ground. Swept along by the fiery will of the horses, terrified Phaeton called on the gods for help. The gods knew that they must act quickly if they were to save earth. Mighty Zeus seized a thunderbolt and hurled it at the chariot, shattering it into pieces. Wreathed in flames, Phaeton was thrown through the sky until he plummeted to his death in the river far below. When Cygnus, Phaeton's close friend, learned of his fate, he searched for many days until he came upon the sun god's chariot, lying broken and burned. Again and again, Cygnus dived into the water, yet, however hard he tried, he could not swim deep enough to reach Phaeton. Exhausted and overcome with grief, Cygnus wept for his dead friend. Phaeton's sisters, too, gathered on the river bank and wept, until eventually they were transformed into poplar trees and their tears turned to golden amber. Moved by Cygnus's sadness, Great Zeus took pity and appeared before him. If I transform you into a swan, you shall be able to swim more strongly than any man, he said, but never again will you take human form. Cygnus paused, imagining living his life forevermore as a swan. Then he remembered his dear friend and solemnly he agreed. As he stood at the water's edge, his mouth became a rounded beak and white feathers hid his hair. His neck grew long, and his arms became powerful wings, while his feet were now gray and webbed. This time, when he plunged into the raging waters, he could swim with ease. And so, swiftly, gently, he removed Phaeton's body. Zeus had been watching from the heavens, and was so impressed by Cygnus's sacrifice that he placed him among the stars. There he flies, still, through the Milky Way, singing his sad swan song in memory of his friend. And to this day, 
earthly swans can be found ducking their slender necks beneath the water, while poplar trees grow tall besides the river banks. Cygnus will be up in the sky this evening after dark, high in the eastern half of the sky. If you are in a dark place, you can see the Milky Way flowing through it. Some folks recognize its central stars as the Northern Cross. Some see its bright star Deneb as the, a corner of the Summer Triangle, which also includes the star Vega from the constellation Lyra and the star Altair from Aquila the Eagle. Our next tale comes from the Inuit people of the Arctic Circle. It tells the origin tale of a group of stars that astronomers recognize as the star cluster the Hyades, which make up the face of the constellation of Taurus, the bull. The Polar Bear and the Hunters Since time began, Inuit hunters have lived in awe of the mighty Nanook, the ghost white polar bear. It is Nanook who decides if a hunt will be fruitful, and for this the Inuit show their respect by offering their weapons to the bear's soul. Seen by day crossing the ice on fur-soled paws, at night Nanook shines brightly among the stars, outrunning its pursu pursuers across the sky. Once, in the far-flung north, a woman left behind her husband and home and headed off across the ice to live among the polar bears. The bears treated her kindly and brought her meat to eat from the seals that they hunted. But as the seasons changed and years passed, the woman grew lonely. She missed her family and her old life and longed to return to visit them. Reluctantly, the bears agreed on one condition. She must not tell anyone that she lived among them or let their secret location be known. Solemnly, the woman made her promise and gladly set off for home. For a while, all was well, until one day, the bears spied the dread sight of hunters in the distance, racing across the snow in their dog-drawn sleds. The woman had broken her promise and brought death and danger into their midst. As the bears fled the hunter's spears, five slavering spittle-flecked dogs were let loose to give chase. Breaking away, Nanook, the master of the bears, ran faster and faster across the ice, the dogs in deadly pursuit, until they reached the very edge of the world and plunged into the sky. There they appear to this day, brightly shining star that is the bear, surrounded by a glittering circle of chase hungry dogs. The constellation of Taurus is an evening sky feature for us in the early winter. Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, is the great bear Nanook. The other stars of the face of Taurus are the chasing dogs. Our third tale comes from the Indian subcontinent. Rather than being a tale of a pattern of stars in the sky, it is the story of one star, the one that we call, commonly call Sirius, or the dog star. Sirius is the brightest star in the nighttime sky. The Dog in Heaven, a tale from India. Sirius is the star that marked the flooding of the River Nile in ancient Egypt each year, and the hottest dog days of summer in ancient Greece. In ancient India, it was known as Svana, a dog sent by the gods to test the kindness of a king. For many years, King Yudhisthira ruled his kingdom wisely and well. Skilled in his duties as a king, he was loved by his people for his goodness and his humility. But long years of war had taken their toll. The king felt worn and old, and his attachment to this life was no longer great. His four younger brothers felt the same, and, together, they decided that the time had come for them to give up their worldly life and make their way to heaven, high among the snow-capped Himalayan mountains. 
Eudistera left his throne to his grandson, and a grand and glittering coronation was held to mark the occasion. Once they had said their farewells, the time came for the brothers to leave the kingdom. Barefoot and dressed in humble robes of white, they set off on their last and greatest journey. By the time they reached the mountains, a small brown dog had joined them, trotting at their heels. No one knew where it had come from, but it followed, faithfully, never leaving Eudistera's side. The brothers named it Zvana and returned its devotions tenfold. As they climbed higher, the harder it became, for the slopes were steep, the air was thin, and the brothers were old and their bodies weak. One by one, they fell by the wayside and died until only Eudistera was left. Gathering his strength, he trudged on, higher and higher into the peaks, alone now except for his loyal brown dog. Finally, the two companions reached the roof of the world, and what he saw took Eudistera's breath away. All around lay snowy summits and sun-struck ridges. Far below, rushing rivers in shadowy valley valleys sparkled in the sunlight. Into this snow-bright landscape there rode a figure, shining with an even more brilliant light. It was Lord Indra, King of Heaven, in a splendid chariot that dazzled with diamonds and pearls. Good Eudistera, he called, what has taken you so long? I have been waiting for you to arrive. Forgive me, my lord, replied Eudistera, I am on my way, but I am old and slow. Come, said Indra, climb into my chariot. I shall take you to heaven myself. Eudistera felt nothing but relief. It had been a long and difficult journey, and he was tired. As he began to climb in, the little dog jumped up beside him. No, not the dog, said Indra. There is no room for a dog in heaven. Then there is no room for me either, said Eudistera, sadly. This dog has been my faithful companion while everyone else was lost. I will not abandon him. He made to get down from the chariot, but as he looked around to call for Svana, the dog was nowhere to be seen. That little dog was your father, Lord Dharma, said Indra, smiling at the puzzled king. He was sent to test your kindness, and you have passed with flying colors. Goodness lies in the humblest of actions, as well as the mightiest. So the king climbed aboard Lord Indra's chariot and sped off through the skies to heaven. And Svana, his faithful dog, was honored with a place high among the stars. Sirius is in the constellation Canis Major, the great dog. That's a Greek constellation. There's no historical evidence that the Greeks identifying it as a dog is related to the Indian tale we've just presented. Our fourth and final tale comes from the Navajo culture of the North American Southwest. It speaks to both the origin tale of the starry sky itself and to one specific feature, the glowing band of the Milky Way. It's hard to describe the beauty of the Milky Way in a dark, star-filled nighttime sky. Unfortunately, nowadays, many people have never really seen the Milky Way in all of its glory. If you step outside of your home on the next clear night and look up, it's unlikely that you will see the glowing band of our galaxy, even though it's almost overhead in the evening at this time of year. Most of us live in areas where there is a huge amount of excessive, badly near engineered outdoor lighting that burns energy, filling the sky with stray light. But again, as I mentioned earlier, most people who have lived throughout time could see the stars in a dark sky on any clear night. The stars were their friends. We strongly recommend that you get to know them too. And make plans when we can start traveling again to get yourself and your family to a place where it still gets dark at night and you can see the Milky Way and the amazing nighttime sky.
How Coyotes Scattered the Stars, a Navajo Tale. In the parched desert landscape of the American Southwest, the night sky reaches out to touch earth in all directions, cloaking it in countless stars. Under these skies, Navajo people built their hogans, or homes, spread their blankets on the ground, and told stories about the stars. Long ago, when earth was young, the Navajo gods met in the Hogan of creation. They painted the sun and moon on the new sky and divided day from night. But they noticed that the night sky still looked dark and bare, even with the luminous light of the moon. As they debated what to do, Black God, the god of fire, arrived in the doorway, dressed all in black, with a buckskin mask charred by sacred flames, a crescent moon on his forehead, and a full moon for his mouth. Attached it to his ankle was a small cluster of twinkling stars, the likes of which the gods had never seen before. Curious, they asked Black God what they were. Without saying a word, Black God walked slowly around the Hogan. As he reached the north side, he stopped and stamped his foot hard on the ground so that the stars on his ankle sprang, sparkling, to his knee. Then he went, in turn, to the east, south, and west, stamping his foot each time. From his knee, each star leapt onto his hip, up to his shoulder, and finally onto his temple. And there they remain, to this day, painted in pride of place on Black God's buckskin mask. The other gods were filled with amazement. What are these strange crystals, they asked, in delight. They are beautiful. Black God answered, they are called stars. The gods debated among themselves quickly and agreed. They asked Black God to make more stars to sprinkle in the deep, dark night sky to make it more beautiful. So Black God pulled out a pouch that he carried always, made from the finest fawn silk and filled with countless crystals. From the pouch, he took out a single crystal that shone bright and clear. He reached up and placed it, ever so carefully, in the north sky. This became North Fire, the star that guides travelers and keeps them safe. Near North Fire, Black God placed the crystal figures of a man and a woman. These were revolving male and revolving female set to circle forever around North Fire. Their spinning path would mark out the shape of a Hogan with North Fire as the heart of the home. Next, Black God turned to the east, south, and west, decorating the sky with more patterns. Man with feet spread apart, rabbit tracks, and horned rattler. Each one placed precisely and perfectly after this, he fashioned a copy of the pattern of stars at his temple and placed them, too, in the sky. Reaching once more into his pouch, he pulled out thousands of tiny crystals and, with a flourish, scattered them across the darkness. After Black God had finished filling the sky with star patterns, he placed some of his own fire in the heavens to light up the stars. The other gods gasped in admiration. The sky was beautiful indeed. Just as Black God sat down to admire his work, the trickster coyote appeared, bent on making mischief. What have you been doing here? Coyote cried. No one asked my opinion. You should have waited for me. See for yourself, Black God replied. We have created patterns in the skies and rules for people to follow. We didn't need your help. Then Black God finally sat down and was about to place his precious pouch under his foot for protection. We'll see about that, said Cunning Coyote, grinning wildly as he reached over and snatched the bag away. Coyote opened the pouch and blew the rest of the crystals far and wide across the sky. They fell as thousands of scattered stars, shimmering and tumbling in a jumble of light and disorder. Laughing, 
Coyote looked into the pouch and found one last crystal. This will be my own star, he said, mimicking and mimicking Black God. He reached high in the sky and carefully placed the star in the south. Now the skies are truly beautiful. And this is how the stars came to be as they are today. The patterns so thoughtfully placed by Black God bring order and guidance to people on Earth. But the rest of the sky is filled with chaos and disorder, apart from the Coyote Star. For the Navajo, these two aspects of the night sky reflect the balance between order and chaos of life itself. The Navajo Coyote Star is the star we call Canopus in the Southern Hemisphere constellation of Carina, the keel of the great ship Argo Navis. It is the second brightest star in the nighttime sky. We can't see it here from the latitude of Northern Illinois, it only, and it only comes up above the horizon in the homelands of the Navajo for a short time each year. Those are the tales that we've the time to share this evening. We hope that you enjoyed them. If you did, there are hundreds of others from all around the world and all through human history and actually prehistory. And here's a practical point that I hadn't mentioned earlier. We may not need to know the stars to tell time or place anymore, but we do need to know them as stargazers. Knowing your way around the nighttime sky helps a lot if you ever want to spot a planet or find an object in binoculars or a telescope. And just like people did in the past, you might find that you learn and remember the patterns in the stars more easily by associating them with images and stories. You can learn the constellations that are in common use by astronomers today. That will help you work with common charts, observing lists, and other resources. But you can also learn the stories of any culture that you choose and find yourself more connected to other stargazers of long ago and far away. Imagining people stepping away from the campfire light to gaze up the stars and tell stories. Well, that's all for this evening. And we're hoping to see you out under the stars before long. Good night.